This is Suzanne Wagner of the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles. In the next hour, you will view part one of a conversation I held with Dr. Marie Louise von Franz in 1977 at her Tower Retreat in Bollingen, Switzerland. To analysts and serious students of Jung, Dr. von Franz needs no introduction. Since Jung's death in 1961, she has published a great many books and has lectured throughout the world. She has become the leading analyst in interpreting Jung's work to a wider body of people. Von Franz was born in Munich in 1915 to Austrian parents who moved the family to Switzerland when she was three years old. She has lived in Switzerland ever since and it has become her home country. When she was 18 and a student at the University of Zurich, she first met Jung with a group of her friends. This was a fateful meeting. Within a year, she had begun analysis with Jung and became his main research assistant in his extensive studies of alchemical texts. Jung recognized her skills and natural talent for this work and encouraged her to complete her studies. She obtained a PhD in classical languages from the University of Zurich and later became a Jungian analyst. Dr. von Franz comments in this interview on the meaning of Jung's concentration on alchemy. We also hear briefly about her interest in the themes which are treated in depth in her recent books, Projection and Recollection in Psychology, Reflections of the Soul, and Dreams and Death. To celebrate the centenary of Jung's birth, von Franz published a biography of Jung, C.G. Jung, His Myth in Our Time. This is an in-depth treatment of the way Jung's discoveries emerged from his own individuation process and is one of the best summaries of his work that is available. On a more personal note, von Franz tells the story of how she came to build her tower retreat, the setting for this film, and the meaning of this place for her creative life and for her ongoing work with the psyche. Von Franz shared this tower for many years with her close friend and colleague, Barbara Hanna. They were warm and gracious to the whole film crew and served us a delicious lunch cooked by Von Franz over the fire. This gave us a genuine flavor of the Swiss country life they enjoyed and the atmosphere of simple solitude that is the hallmark of this tower. This conversation was filmed in March of 1977. Since that time, Dr. Von Franz has retired from practice and from teaching. Dr. Von Franz, I wanted to ask you about your early life before you met Jung. Uh, did you have any experiences of the psyche yourself that interested you or made you curious, dreams or... Uh, not that I remember, except that I have remembered two very impressive childhood dreams. But uh, I think what led me later to Jung was that when I was about 10 years ago, I read in some youth paper that you can uh, make amber out of resin. Or rather that amber comes from resin being rolled about in the sea for a long time. So I got the idea I would make that artificially and I arranged myself an alchemical laboratory and worked with artificial seawater and resin for over a year and developed wild fantasies about making a yellow pearl which even talked to the resin like the old alchemists did and say you have to suffer now and go through the fire and be unhappy but you will become a beautiful yellow pearl and I think that fantasy <laughs> with which I lived for a long time uh, was some kind of preparation to meet you. Uh -huh. That was when you were 10 years yes. old. And then when did you meet him? I met him when I was 18. I went to school with a nephew of Miss Tony Wolf, and he knew, knew Jung and one day Jung said to him, you can uh, invite a few boys of your class up to Bollingen, and he asked if he could also bring a girl, <laughs> and Jung laughed and said, naturally. 
So we went uh, six boys, and that one, seven, and I, we mix eight. We were invited to Bollingen just uh, shortly before leaving school, and uh, that's how I met him, by so-called chance. Uh -huh. Did you recognize a fateful meeting at that time? Oh, yes, I did. Mm. I w we went out there to the tower, and... Uh, out of the bushes, suddenly, we were standing around, kind of, you know, awkwardly, as one does, <laughs> not knowing <laughs> what was going to happen. And then out of the bushes came a man, and I was deeply impressed by him. I thought, he, naturally, he was a Methuselah, because I, when you are 18, you think a 58-year-old is, a, is a <laughs> ready for the cemetery. <laughs> and uh, then there was one story which he told uh, us, he dived right in, away into psychology already at lunch. We stayed lunch till supper and till late in the evening. That we'll stay the whole day with him. And he told that story, which you can read in the memories, about this girl who was on the moon and had to fight a demon, and the black demon got her. Oh. And uh, I was, and he pretended he, or he told it in a way as if he, she really had been on the moon and it had happened. And I was very rationalistically trained from school, so I, I said indignantly, but she imagined to be on the moon, or she dreamt it, but she wasn't on the moon. And he, he looked at me earnestly and said, yes, she was on the moon. And I thought for a long time, I still remember looking over the lake there and thinking, and either this man is crazy, or I am too stupid to understand what he means. <coughs> And then suddenly it dawned on me, he means that what happens psychically is the real reality. And the, this other moon, this stony desert which goes around the earth, that's illusion or that's only pseudo-reality. Mm -hmm. And that hit me tremendously deeply. Mm -hmm. When I crawled rather drunk into bed because he gave us a lot of <laughs> burgundy, that evening I thought it'll take you ten years to digest what you experienced today. When did you tell him about your own alchemical laboratory? Did you tell him? That I told him only later, but mm. it went on like that, that uh, I didn't dare, I wanted to get in contact with him, but I didn't dare, I was too shy, and he was a great, obviously a great man, and I was nobody. So I began to read his books, and I tried to analyze myself on account of his books, and that got me into deep waters, and I had a tremendous dream with a vision in it. And that absolutely knocked me over, and I didn't know how to go on. So then I wrote to him. And this big dream I had was all, a, at least the solution of it was all alchemy. So then I wrote to him if I could have an interview, and when I had an interview, I told him that big dream. And he said, Oh Lord, oh Lord, I knew you had to do s with alchemy, but I, I didn't know it was that much. Uh -huh. And then I, I had to confess to him, I said I would like to come in analysis with him. And he said, you want a teaching analysis? And I said, no, I'm quite crazy enough to have a real one. <laughs> you see, I thought teaching analysis was some superficial nonsense. And so he laughed, but then I confessed I had no money. My parents gave me absolutely not a centine though I was 18. So he said, well, that fits very well. You can help me to translate the Latin and the Greek text, because I want now to really dive into alchemy. He was there thinking of it all the time, but hadn't begun yet, really. Mm -hmm. And you can help me, because I had intended to study classical philology. Actually, from a dream I told him in Bollingen, and he told me I should, on account of it, do that. And uh, you can translate these texts for me, and I'll analyze you. That will be the exchange business. So hmm. that's what we did from the beginning. Hmm. Well, this was before his trip to India. His trip and to that India came dream. just a bit afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, about a year later. Mm -hmm. I met him in 33, and I began in the, the year later, in 34, I began analysis mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. And when he was in India, you write about the dream he had that's about the grail. Yes. That sent him right back to, to alchemy yes. in a big way. Yes. And you were working all of that time yes. on it. 
So it's almost as if he himself didn't realize how how important it was. Oh yes, he knew, he realized how important it was more and more. Uh -huh. But uh, his hesitation was that these texts are very very difficult to partly also manuscripts are very difficult to decipher. And though he later again knew Latin and Greek fluently as well as I do, but uh, in the, there at that time he had forgotten it a bit. He had trouble to get into it because he had not practiced it for a long time. And that was one of the hesitations. And the other hesitation, I guess, that he has never said, but I guess was that to dive into such a weird material would uh, cause a lot of misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was already always insulted of being a prophet and a mystic, and now digging up this occult alchemy on top of it all, you know. Mm -hmm. But he knew he had to do it. All his dreams pushed him in that direction. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel it a burden yourself, this uh, uh, work on alchemy, as if, uh, I mean, your dreams pushed you also, but did you? No, I, I was carried by a wild enthusiasm all the time. Uh -huh. No, I never felt it as a burden. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that that work has been received yet? in the world? I think it's beginning to be received, but many people still say the alchemical books they don't understand. They understand the earlier work better. Mm -hmm. And I think it will still take about 10, 20 years for the people to realize what alchemy really means and how important it is. Mm -hmm. It's beginning now. It's dawning on the people. Mm -hmm. Have people in other fields picked up on your work with Jung and alchemy and on the, the meaning of the Mercurius figure, people in theology or in... No, as far as I know, mm -hmm. practically nobody. Mm -hmm. So in the Jungian circles, naturally, there are people who are highly interested in alchemy, but outside Jungian circles, uh, people still stumble over mm -hmm. the weirdness of the material. Mm -hmm. Are you working on it still now? No, I have dropped it for a while, though it's always in the back of everything I write. I mean, I have it in the back. But I intend to go back to it for my dreams. I intend to, when I have finished what I'm doing now, I'm going to uh, probably try to write on the resurrection body in alchemy. Because uh -huh. there's, there's nothing about it in Christian theology, or practically nothing, mm -hmm. just nonsense. Is there a but connection alchemy. to the subtle body? Yes, naturally. Uh -huh. You see, it, it, uh, Western alchemy is a parallel attempt to what in Eastern Taoism and Buddhism is trying to build the diamond body, or the eternal body, which survives death, mm -hmm. which is a kind of subtle body. Mm -hmm. So, dreams and symbols having to do with the, this building of a subtle body are really objective material. There is a, it's not just a, a myth or a story, but it's an objective <laughs> reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is the reality. Mm -hmm. All the rest is superficial illusion. Mm -hmm. it, it's what really happens mm -hmm. in a human being. Mm -hmm. And therefore, at the end of life, there's the big showdown. Have you frittered away your life in superficiality? Mm -hmm. Or as Jung said about a woman once, five minutes after her death, she'll not remember this life anymore. <laughs> or have you built something eternal mm -hmm. in which your individuality can survive? and not to just get dissolved like the atoms of your body. Mm -hmm. So death itself is the showdown. I mean, I a, think so, a yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you say when someone asks you about life after death? I say, I believe in it, but you needn't believe in it if you don't want to, <laughs> or if you have no evidence to believe in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't prove it to anybody or 
ram it down their throat. If they don't want to believe it, they have reasons not to believe it. That's okay, too. Do you think it's important to develop, to fantasize about death? Oh, yes. I know that one aged pupil went to Jung uh, a few years before his death and in order to find out what he thought about life after death and death, and he said, that won't help you on your own deathbed to think what I believed. You have to f build up your own uh, viewpoint. You have to work on it yourself mm -hmm. and find your own standpoint. You cannot quote Jung in the, in the dying moment, <laughs> moment of dying. <laughs> wouldn't help much. <laughs> you gave some hints in your book on Jung and his myth in our time of work that needs to be done in the future, especially in relation to projection. And you, and you, you mention reflection yes. as, uh, as the counter mechanism, so to speak. I mean, projection and reflection are uh, an op a pair of opposite, mm -hmm. because projection, as the word says, uh, throws behind your back your, your own psychic images and contents into the outer world. We live all the time in projections. We live in a world of projection. And reflection is the act by taking that back into yourself. But you can't uh, do that by your own willpower. I mean, you have to be helped by the self. Mm -hmm. So both of these activities of the psyche are, are be below the ego or beyond the ego. It's not they are beyond, Oh, yes, they are beyond the ego, but mm -hmm. the ego can cooperate with them or mm -hmm. persevere in wrong. For instance, Jung defines in a narrower sense projection that we can only speak of a projection, though it's constant projection. What I think about you is a projection. What I think about all these people is a projection. I don't know you well enough to really know you. I, I mm -hmm. have an image and I have a judgment, mm -hmm. an intuitive judgment, but it's probably a lot of my own psyche in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but that you cannot call projection. Jung says in a s strict sense, you can only begin to call it projection when it's disturbing when there is a disturbance, when I, for instance, constantly quarrel with you or constantly misunderstand you and it becomes a kind of difficulty between you and me, hmm. then one can speak of a projection. And that is also the symptom which shows now the moment is to take it back, to reflect. The disturbance is the symptom which wants you to reflect and, and to say, now, why am I so emotional or why do I have these hmm negative feelings each time I meet that person or so on. And that is the beginning of reflection? And that's the beginning of ref reflection, but it's only achieved when you really see in yourself that quality mm -hmm. which irritates you or which you admire in the other. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help to say, oh, mea culpa, uh, I have a shadow like so and so, I have a, an animus like so and so, that doesn't help at all. I must really see it, uh, and that means I must catch it in flagranti. I must do something and say, my God, now I'm acting like so and so. Uh -huh. Then I have it. Uh -huh. Then I know how, where it is in me and how it's functioning in me. And then I know what kind of a voice I have and what kind of a body feeling I have when I live that complex. And then I can keep it inside and not put it onto other people anymore. Hmm. In, the, in the process of having a fantasy about someone, is it possible that you are, that the fantasy is helping you to see Yes, you see, you never know. It might, be the, uh, it might be an intuition which really fits the other person. I might have an intuition about you and it's really how you are. Mm -hmm. Or it might not fit. That's why only when it's, there's a disturbance you can be sure it's a projection. Except if you want to uh, take on Hindu philosophy and say finally everything is a projection. Mm -hmm. And that looks like it in that way, that if you remember Jung in the memory, seeing that yogi meditating him. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the self projects our whole life. It's 
Our whole life and fate is a projection of the self. Hmm. And when the self takes it back, we, we are out. There's something else in your book that is very intriguing. You mentioned that the Jung discovered realms beyond the self. I, I don't know quite how to put it. That, it's, that the psyche is always opening up Yes, more and more. new horizons. New horizons. Yes, he said, for instance, behind, he said, uh, the self is represented by the wise old man in a man and by the earth mother in a woman. But he said behind them is again a feminine figure in the man and a masculine figure in the woman. But he said, people already don't understand when I talk about these, so it's not worth even mentioning these further horizons. They wouldn't, they wouldn't follow. Mm -hmm. Did he ever write about it? No. No. He talked to you about it? Not much, Not no. Much. He just told that and... So he let that go? Uh, as far as communication to the world is concerned, yes. Mm -hmm. Have you had that experience yourself? No, no. Mm -hmm. I can say figures of, feminine figures of the self is the, the furthest I've gotten in my dreams, mm -hmm. as far as I can. Mm -hmm. Judge. Is it any more difficult to reflect on negative images than on positive images? Aren't they they both equally difficult? It's individually difficult. Some people are more willing to look at their dark side and terrified if they have to look at their own positive side mm. and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And other people who love to hear about their own positive side but get absolutely dismayed if they have to look at their shadow. Mm -hmm. That's different. Mm -hmm. Do you see this process of reflection as, a, as something vital for survival? Uh, yes. Now? Yes. I think that if not more people try to reflect and take back their projections and take the opposites within themselves, there will be a total destruction. This can happen. One doesn't need to be an analysis for this process of reflection to happen. Oh, no. no. There are many people who are not in analysis, but if they are naturally gifted, which I would call, if they are honest, they can find these things without analysis. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the publication of Jung's work and the work of his students is, uh, will touch people who never, deeply, who never go I'm sure analysis? it has already touched. I get always letters from people who say that uh, they have begun to read Jung and uh, that changed their whole life. Uh, just yesterday, a letter from a man in the east part of Germany saying that uh, Jung is for him everything because he was very neurotic as a young man, and since he's read Jung, it has helped him to survive and to found a happy family, and that he has a photograph of Jung on his desk and try to live it and keep in contact with it as much as possible. In Mysterium Conjunctionis, Jung makes a comment about the imagery of the alchemical, the alchemical imagery that he's working with in that book being related to the masculine psyche. And I've not understood that because wasn't there always a sore mystica? Yes, but the books uh, which, we, which we have are mostly written uh, by male alchemists. So the soror is mystica collaborated and, and probably did a lot to the work, but they have not left any documents. Mm -hmm. So we have no direct uh, document except from the 17th century. And we have no earlier documents written by women. None at all? None at all. Do you expect that they would differ, that they would have different... 
<laughs> there was one alchemist, I've just forgotten his name. He was a father and he lived in, in an incestuous uh, relationship with his daughter. And they made alchemical experiments together. And then they decided uh, to uh, both write a book on alchemy, but separately. That's 17th century. Mm -hmm. And he wrote uh, a poem and she wrote a very, very learned long book. So you see. So the, can you talk a little more about that? The, do you think there's an essential difference in the creative um, products of a, of a man and a woman or in the creative process? I don't think the results are really very different. But uh, the way one gets to it uh, may differ. I think that the motivation for a woman to be creative is mostly love. It is very rarely that a woman uh, would feel motivated to, to do creative research work or do creative things without l being in love. Ah. It's the carrying force, so to speak. Well, for a man, it, it, the, the interest is genuinely objective, so to speak. But he needs the woman's help and her love. Otherwise, he'll produce dry stuff, dry rational stuff. So he needs that inspiration as well. But it's secondary, and in the woman, it's primary, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, this love uh, can be love for... Uh, not just a person, but love. <laughs> <laughs> Jung said he, he gave up defining love, and if Jung say, <laughs> thought, felt defeated, I am not going to try. <laughs> 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 but when we go back to this man that wrote you the letter from East Germany, yes. he was deeply touched by Jung's work, yes. his books, yes. and there were, must have been love there. Yes, he yes. didn't comment on that in his letter, but he, mm -hmm. I'm sure he wouldn't understand a lot of Jung if he hadn't loved once in his life. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the relationship between transference and love? Well, in the transference, which is an expression which Jung took actually over from Freud, uh, and Freud thought it was purely a, a projection of the parental image onto the partner and so on. And an Oedipal or Electra complex projected. That's why at the end of a Freudian therapy, you cut off, goodbye, we have never known each other. Projections are handed back and goodbye. While we think certainly in the beginning stages of the relationship, there is generally a lot of projection mixed up with it. And that is responsible for all those love quarrels. I mean, she makes demands which he can't fulfill, and he makes demands she can't fulfill, and animus anima uh, crossing the swords. And I mean, if you tape record a love quarrel, it's the same all over the world, literally. <laughs> and, and that is projection. And if people don't run away, but work it out, and take back all what is projection in it. Then appears or is peeled out of all this uh, the true relationship. Now it might be none. And then it would be like the Freudian thing, goodbye, and uh, now I see you simply represented that and that in me, and thank you very much, goodbye. Or there might be a tremendous amount of relationship, true relationship built up which is not the same thing as projection. Mm -hmm. And generally, uh, in many, many cases, uh, this is so, that a certain friendship and relationship results, finally. After all, an analysis is a very intimate exchange of personality, so it would be ridiculous to, to leave each other afterwards and, you know, not having known each other, so to speak, if it has been an honest analysis. Mm -hmm. where both partners have been honestly involved in it. Mm -hmm. So you can say the 
Kyle's columns is, uh, implies that there it is the beginning stage of still a lot of projection mixed up with it. And therefore, all these kind of compulsivenesses, people cry if you don't see them often enough, and the uh, childish demands, and all that kind of trouble. And then it gets replaced slowly or purified into what you could call an objective relationship. What about the self or the image of God in, in the transference connection? Is it very often different? when there is a, 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 a very violent uh, transference, the image of God or a goddess is, is, you see, the animus is finally in his most... Uh, Sublime aspect is a god image, and the anima in her sublime aspect is a goddess. See the Virgin Mary. So if the tra uh, that is projected, it makes for a very, very violent transference, and then slowly one discovers, <coughs> naturally, no partner can fulfill the role of a god. If you ask the other to be a god or a goddess, you will certainly be disappointed uh, sooner or later. And uh, therefore, then Jung found out, as he explains in two essays, that the unconscious seemed to reinforce uh, the, the tremendous importance of the other. For instance, uh, this woman who had such a terrific transference dreamt that Jung was carrying her in a field of wheat and was in, in, in the wind. And then Jung realized from that dream that uh, there was a projection of a God image involved that what the woman was really seeking for was a God image, and that had projected itself upon him. And that, then he could work on that with her. That is not necessarily part of every transference, deep transference. Yeah, when it goes very, very deep, when it's a very fateful thing, so to speak, which inf influences the whole life of a person, then generally there is an image of the self or a God image involved. Because that amounts for the violence of the transference and amounts also for the people not being able to run away, otherwise they would run away from it. Hmm. In, in that kind of a transference, do you think it's important to have a relationship outside of analysis? I mean, I think you cannot judge on that. It either happens or it doesn't happen. You can't mm -hmm. produce mm -hmm. it. I mean, that would be foolish to to try to manipulate anything in that mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. But unions in general seem more open to that possibility of a of a friendship outside of analysis. Yes, naturally. Mm -hmm. That's what I tried to allude at before when I said, slowly peels out of all this transference stuff a, a real relationship, and that might be a close one or a less close one. Jung always said that's regulated by the self. He said, I, I cannot uh, decide on it. Either it's meant or it's not meant, and it comes out as the self or God or fate wants it to be. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it, it, it can be closer or, or less close. But uh, unions are on basically open to it. You have to just find out. I, I sometimes invite some of my analysants, and sometimes uh, it's quite an experience. Analysants I like and I'm interested in, in in the hours. When I go out with them for dinner, I'm deadly bored. Mm -hmm. We have nothing to say to each other. Then I realize either it will never be, or the stage hasn't come to, to establish any private contact, there's nothing there. Mm. He or she can only talk about their own problems, or there's a, nothing to exchange. Mm. And with other people, it's different. You get, even, you, you get closer once you go out to dinner, you feel, no, that's, that's even a nicer contact than always discussing dreams. Mm. There is a real possibility of relationship. So you can only experiment and watch your own dreams and find out, and, and the patient's dreams, naturally. After uh, you go out with a patient, you can afterwards look what they dream afterwards, if, if, mm. if it goes wrong or if it was too much for them. And some can't take the weight of their analyst. 
we get quite befuddled when they uh, have to talk, have a private talk. In the transference uh, phenomenon, is there um, a gradual confrontation with evil? Um, yes, because when a woman is in love, her shadow comes up in form of jealousy, power, wanting to put the man she loves in her pocket, eat him up completely, cutting out all other ladies around him. Yeah. And there you have evil. <laughs> <laughs> right away, jealousy, as Jung once said, is the greatest flaw of the feminine nature. And in the man, the same thing. Mm. So, if the totality is constellated, the self is constellated, automatically evil steps in uh, very strongly. You know it yourself, as, as soon as things begin to terribly matter, then you get, for instance, aggressive or in a fighting spirit about them. Now you see, for instance, my land here matters to me, so I'm in a fighting spirit to defend my land. If it wouldn't matter to me, I would say, oh, never mind how it looks like. Mm. Mm -hmm. All the more in a relationship. So then one has to learn how to live with that. One has to make it conscious mm -hmm. and become conscious of it. <coughs> and then on top of it, pardon it to oneself. That's the worst. At least for some people. Mm -hmm. Jung's tower in Bollingen has been, he has, he has spoken of it as um, the place where he really lived the self. In the second person, yes, or uh, the self, yes. Uh -huh. And there came a point in his life when that was important to sacrifice some outer interests. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in, in his insisting on your building a tower at a certain point, you wanted to wait. You thought later would be fine. And he said, no, do it now. How do you feel about that now? Was, it, was he right? Well, he saved this whole situation because a year later, after I built this, they made uh, building areas, they dis uh, and this is not a building area. So if I had waited a year, I could, this was, tower would never exist. And Jung's intuition, parapsychological intuition, he didn't know that rationally, but he must have felt, get it done. I'm interested in the, in the fact that it's square and not round. Yes, uh, I thought of the I Ching. Uh, the heaven, the masculine is round and the earth is square. That's why I had the idea of making it square. Can you say more about that, that the feminine is square or the difference? between? Well, in the I Ching, the, the roundness of heaven is, is the dynamic yang principle, the, the creative, and, the, and uh, the yin principle, the feminine, is what makes things real. And in reality, you have mostly straight lines and corners and so on. So that's why the Chinese think that the, the square is the symbol of uh, reality and the earth, because the feminine is helps the creative to, to enter reality or to incarnate in reality. Do you write here in your tower? I do only, my writing I do only here. I can't do it in Lindenburg where there's a telephone and the people and so on. I couldn't do it. I c that's why I stay a lot here to write. It's the only place I can get into myself enough and, you know, continuously enough without interruption. And the unconscious comes up much more. I have much more dreams when I'm here than down in Kisnacht. Now that Jung is gone, uh, what do you do about working with your dreams with someone else? Do you find the need to? Uh, I, w I, I find a, a very great need to, and I don't know what to do about it. I try out all my friends, <laughs> but uh, 
already in Jung's lifetime, Jung complained that I had very complicated dreams. He sometimes wiped his forehead after an hour and said, what would you do if you hadn't a Jung to interpret your complicated dreams? <laughs> and once he said sadly, and I haven't a Jung to interpret mine. And at the time I thought that was an amusing joke, but I see now it's very, very difficult. I sometimes talk to some of my pupils or analysands about my dreams and even if they don't get the meaning by talking about it, I get it very often. If you talk long enough around it and spill out the associations to somebody else, then you suddenly, you have it. But it is a great difficulty. You mentioned when you were in the States recently that Jung had a vision at the end of his life of a catastrophe. Can you speak about that a little bit? It was a world catastrophe. I don't want to speak much about it, but uh -huh. uh, he, he tried to convey to his family so, some things and uh, when he was right dying and they didn't get the point, so he called for me, but they wouldn't let call me. But uh, one of his daughters took notes and after his death gave it. And there's a drawing with a line going down, up and down and underneath is the last 50 years of humanity. And, and some remarks about a final catastrophe being ahead. But I have only those notes. Mm -hmm. What is your own feeling about it? The, the world well, one's whole, one's whole feeling revolts against this idea. But since I have those notes in a drawer, I, I don't allow myself to be too optimistic. I think, well, we have always had wars and enormous catastrophes, and I, ha I have no more personal fear much about that. I mean, at my age, if you, ha you have any how soon to go, so or so or so, it egocentrically spoken. But, but the beauty of all the life, uh, to think that the billions and billions and billions of years of ev evolution to build up the plants and the animals and the whole beauty of nature, and that man would go out of sheer shadow foolishness and, foolishness and destroy it all. I mean, that our life might go from the planet. And we don't know. On Mars and Venus, there's no life. We don't know if there's any life experiment elsewhere in the galaxies. And we go and destroy this. I think it's so abominable. I, I, I try to pray that it may not happen, that a miracle happens. Do you find that uh, young people that you see now are aware of that, that, that in, it's in their consciousness? Yes, it's it partly in their unconsciousness and partly in their consciousness. And I think in a very dangerous way, namely in a way of giving up and running away into a fantasy world. You know, you, when you study science fiction, you see there's always the fantasy of escaping to some other planet and begin anew again, which means give up the battle on this earth. Look, uh, consider it hopeless and give up. And uh, a sort of defeatism. And perhaps that is because it is, uh, there is a world catastrophe impending and they are only feeling what is true, but I think one shouldn't give up. Because if you think of answer to Job, if man would wrestle with God, if man would tell God that he shouldn't do it, if we would reflect more, that's why reflection comes in, one might just sneak round the corner. You never thought that we might do better than just possibly sneak round the corner with not too big a catastrophe. When I saw him last, he, he had also a vision while I was with him, but there he said, I see enormous stretches devastated, enormous stretches of the earth, but thank God it's not the whole planet. So mm -hmm. perhaps that is true.
So many young people today here in Switzerland and in the States and everywhere are um, heavily involved with drugs, drug taking. Well, that is the, is the underlying despair and, the, uh, and an attempt to just escape the whole problem because it's too much for them. They can't cope with it. But it's naturally absolutely no way out. We would need all those young people to, to fight it, the problem instead of walking out on it, on us. What uh, happens when someone comes to you in analysis and is uh, taking drugs? Do you? I do nothing. I, I just analyze them normally. And up till now, I've always seen that the unconscious is very strongly against taking drugs. So that it's, then I say, look here, it's not me. It's your own soul which tells you not to do it and that you are destroying yourself. It's your dream which tells you it's destructive. It's not, it's not my moralism. You don't have to take that role. I don't have to take that role, then that only evokes uh, resistances. But when they have blatant dreams telling them that they are, that they are committing slow suicide, then so some of them pick up their socks. And I had once an interesting case. He, he took drugs and had never any bad symptoms, LSD. And then he went into analysis and then he gave, gave it up. And one day, the devil whispered in his ear, and he, thought, and he knew he shouldn't do it anymore. He was uh, above it, so to speak. He out, had outgrown it. But then the devil whispered in his ear, and he thought, oh, well, I'll just take it once again. And he took it. And from that, he got a terrible head shake like that for three months, which frightened him terribly. And before, he had never any uh, physical symptoms. But it was as if now he couldn't take it anymore, though his body even revolted. And he had a very bad trip before. He had sometimes good trips. But when he did it then, so to speak, knowing better, then he had a very bad trip. And then he really gave it up. He had enough. Every analytic relationship is a whole new experience. Yes. Oh, yes. That's why we had sometimes students at the Institute asking Jung why he didn't make a, a theory of neurosis. How do you treat hysterics? What do you do with schizophrenics? What do you do with compulsion neurosis, etc., etc.? What, what are the problems? And he said, just not, because then you, you just put an etiquette and you say, that's a, a compulsion neurosis. Instead of taking every patient as a new thing which you have, a new human being whose tragedy and problems you have to find out. A new. And not think, oh, well, that's again the how same did thing. You, how did you decide to be an analyst? How did it come about uh, that you decided? I never decided it. Uh, once a, a very, very heavily schizophrenic old woman, she was my first patient, uh, suddenly declared she wanted to analyze with me. I was uh, a Latin teacher in, in the school. That's how, how I earn my living. And I asked Dr. Jung if I should take her. And he said, well, she's so crazy, you can't ruin her anyhow anymore, so you can try. And so she became my first analyzant. And then slowly more and more followed. And finally, there were so many that I had to give up my schoolwork. So you were fetched into it by... I grew into it, so mm -hmm. to speak, unintentionally. If you had to give a brief a description, what would you say the main value of the research and the writing that you and Jung have done on alchemy is? I would say that a civilization needs a myth to live. We know that if missionaries destroy the myth of a primitive people, they, they destroy them also physically. They begin to drink, they degenerate, they are lost. 
and no civilization can live only from welfare. It, it, needs, it needs a myth to live. All civil, great civilizations, when they were flourishing, had a living myth. And I think that the Christian myth on which we have lived has degenerated and has become one-sided and insufficient. And I think that alchemy is the complete myth. And that therefore, if our civili Western civilization has a, a possibility of survival, it would be by accepting the alchemical myth, which is a completion and continuation but and richer completion of the Christian myth. That's a myth we could live, ag live again with in contrast to the Christian myth, which doesn't satisfy a great amount of people anymore. And the Christian myth is deficient on not including enough the feminine, or in Catholicism they have the Virgin Mary, but it's only the purified feminine. It's not the dark feminine. And in excluding matter and treating matter as dead and the realm of the, of the devil, and in not facing the problem of the opposites, of evil. And alchemy faces the problem of the opposites, faces the problem of matter, and faces the problem of the feminine. The three things which are lacking in Christianity. And therefore it complements Christi the Christian myth, and could revive it too, that way. When you speak about the livingness of matter, I have heard stories of a uh, young in his tower talking to his pots and pans. Oh, well, naturally, that was partly a joke, but you know, <laughs> one of the last times he went to the tower, for instance, he hadn't been there for a long time, and the first days, uh, the, the covers of the pans like to jump off and fall on the floor in the wrong moments, and you know how objects uh, can absolutely misbehave. So he, st he p put himself up in the middle of the kitchen and said, now, ladies and gentlemen, pots and, <laughs> and spoons, uh, I know I have neglected you for a long time and you are angry with me, but I beg your pardon and I ask you now to cooperate again. And from then on, at least Ruth Bailey tells, there were no more accidents. <laughs> <laughs> he had great fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I notice it when I come up after the winter, when I come up in this house, there's all sorts of imps. <laughs> the W door doesn't lock anymore because it's gotten rusty and, you know, matter, matter if it has to cooperate with you, needs loving care. And not no, only technically by oiling and so on. You have to kind of live with it. <laughs> Otherwise it plays you tricks. We're not used to that in, in our upbringing, to relate to matter that way. Well, we have to revive primitive superstition. Because in primitive people, they, their sword has a soul, their hammer has a soul. No smith would start making a sword without a ritual first. The, still in the Middle Ages, the heroes who depended on their sword, think if your sword breaks in battle, you are, you are a dead man. So their sword had a name and a soul. They knew that sword and the solidity of that sword wa was their fate. And now it's still so. Let a few of your uh, atomic plants explode and please. So, even in our daily life, there is a chance to relate to matter in a yes. new way, deeper way. Yes. If you notice, it's highly symbolic. The days you can't open a door, you can't get at something, or uh, some object hides from you just when you, you, generally when you are in, not in yourself and in, in an impatient mood or so on, then everything plays you tricks. It's naturally your own unconscious mixed up with it. But it, it, it communicates with matter. <laughs>